True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. The Rabinowitzes were the perfect couple in love with good jobs. They had a beautiful young daughter, a year old. He had a business of his own selling latex gloves and supplies. They had been married since 1990. She was a lawyer, Bryn Mawr and Temple University educated. Stephanie spoke about her marriage in, in very idyllic terms. I mean, she thought she had a wonderful relationship, almost a perfect relationship in that, and she was extremely happy. Generally, when we interview people, witnesses, victims, suspects, um, we look to see if they have eye contact with us, see if they're shaking or if they're very nervous or if they're perspiring, and he didn't exhibit any of those signs. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Today's episode is brought to you by You Can't Make This Up, a new podcast from Netflix that takes a look behind the scenes of the documentaries and true stories everyone's talking about, including Making a Murderer, Wild Wild Country, Evil Genius, Amanda Knox, and the Academy Award-winning film Icarus. Join podcasters, journalists, and comedians as they chat with creators and get an exclusive look inside their process, explore the stories they left out, and find answers for your burning questions. You can't make this up is available on Stitcher, Apple, Spotify, or your preferred podcast destination. Go listen, subscribe, and review now. When Stephanie Rabinowitz set her mind to something, there was no stopping her. She was an attorney who had married her childhood sweetheart. She was extremely hardworking and an attentive mom to her one-year-old girl, Haley. After tragedy struck in the Rabinowitz home, it came to light that Stephanie's husband, Craig, had been leading a secret life. Craig Rabinowitz, who had racked up huge debts and whose business apparently only existed on paper, had been spending more money than he earned in a lifetime on a stripper who danced for him at a downtown Philadelphia club, Delilah's Den. This is a story that was locally known as the Mainline Murder, a death nearly passed on as natural and unexplained. This murder revealed motivations and deception that nearly went undiscovered, and it would shock everyone who knew the Rabinowitz family. So let's drink a beer from Pennsylvania. From Philly? No, close, Hershey. It's called Nugget Nectar. Better be chocolate. It's not. (laughs) By Trogues Brewing Company. I hope I pronounced that correctly. This is an imperial red ale. I just assumed that all beer in Hershey would be chocolate. Well, that's probably a good assumption, but this one isn't. I'm trying to branch out and try different beers. So this one, and before I get into that, I mean, imperial reds are beers that are brewed to have somewhat of a balance between hop bitterness and malt sweetness. So it's basically an IPA, but maybe toned down on the hops. And you might remember, my dear, one time in Albuquerque, we had a a red ale at La Cumbre Brewing. You enjoyed it immensely, as I recall. (laughs) So we'll leave it at that. So this beer, Nugget Nectar, is a cherry amber color. Very pretty looking beer. Big white head, a lot of lacing. Nice looking beer. Citrus and pine aroma, and some nice sweet malt. Then we get grapefruit and pine on the first taste, leading to caramel in the middle of the taste, and some nice lingering pine at the end. Medium bodied, great beer, drink a few. Actually, I bought a six pack. We won't drink all of them, we'll share. Okay, well, I'll carry the beer just down, and you can carry your crutches, so let's open it up. All right. Okay, y'all settled in there? You got your foot elevated? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's get started. All right. Stephanie Rabinowitz had been a high achiever with an intensity to her personality since she was a young child. At age 11, she decided that she wanted to learn to read Torah. Now, the Torah is a collection of the first five books of the Judaic scriptures, the entire body of Jewish law and learning, and obviously it's written in Hebrew. Now, reading Torah meant chanting from the scripture in the original language. It's not easy, because one had to recreate the intonations required to give meaning to the words, 
all on her own, Stephanie had called the cantor at the synagogue and arranged for lessons. Then she had devoted herself to learning them. By the time Stephanie had her bat mitzvah at age 13, she was an accomplished Torah reader, qualified to read and help teach younger readers also. So I'm pretty impressed with that. I think that gives us a good feeling of the type of person Stephanie was. So whenever I hear about somebody doing this stuff, I'm reminded of our oldest daughter, who was in Israel for a couple of years after she finished her doctorate and learned Hebrew and is fluent and reads Torah in her synagogue and does it quite well. And I'm always impressed with people that can do stuff like that. Well, and here we're talking about an 11-year-old. I know. So I'm pretty impressed. That's an amazing thing. This is a bright kid. Yes, exceptionally bright and motivated. Yes. So in the summer of 1983, Stephanie was a counselor in training at Camp Wohilo, a facility for girls near Gettysburg. It was during her time there that she met Craig Rabinowitz, a boy who was a counselor at a nearby facility, Camp Comet Trails. He was four years older than Stephanie, and at the time was an undergrad at Temple University. Stephanie had been interested in another Philadelphia college, the University of Pennsylvania, and Stephanie remembered Craig saying that he had a friend at Penn, so she called him to get the friend's name so that she could learn more about the school. Craig gave it to her, and then he asked her out to a movie. He asked her out again to an ice hockey game afterwards. And on the night of that date, while she was waiting for Craig to pick her up, she began having second thoughts about the date, wondering if Craig was really someone that she wanted to continue seeing. She told her mother about her reservations, but to her mother's eternal regret, she convinced Stephanie that she needed to keep her commitment that night. So Stephanie went to the game with Craig, and from that day onward, Craig was the only guy for her. Whenever her mother Anne suggested that she date someone besides Craig, just to be able to compare him to other boys, Stephanie rolled her eyes and ignored her. Then, on June 17, 1990, seven years after that summer at camp, and two weeks after her 23rd birthday, Stephanie married Craig. When Stephanie was a high school student, she earned a National Merit Scholarship, and she selected Bryn Mawr for her undergraduate school, intending to be a physician. But in her freshman year, she figured out that she was squeamish about needles, so she decided to switch her major to political science. She graduated with honors in 1989. The following fall, she was accepted into law school at Temple University, from which she graduated again with honors in 1992. After passing the bar on her first try, she took an impressive job with a very well-respected law firm. Craig, at this point, seemed very proud of his wife, and he worked while she was in law school, trying to help her accomplish her dream of becoming a lawyer. But in many ways, Craig and Stephanie were opposites. While Stephanie had always been determined to get the best education she could, Craig cared very little about his schooling. He grew up in Penn Wynn as the son of an executive with BVD, the huge clothing manufacturer. He had graduated high school as an average student, and he'd been lucky to be accepted at Temple, and he dropped out after just one semester. Education was really secondary to his interest in sports. Craig was not really that athletic, but he was a jock in his heart, and he was a lifelong fan of baseball and hockey. After he and Stephanie were married, he continued to play deck hockey, which is basically ice hockey without the ice. Andy played first base on a softball team that was sponsored by the Jewish Community Center. And there is another noticeable difference with Stephanie and Craig. She was unpretentious and practical, but Craig wanted the best of everything. After they set their wedding date, they registered for gifts, and even though most of their friends were still in college or had only recently graduated and couldn't afford expensive wedding presents, Craig insisted on choosing the most expensive items he could, in terms of Waterford crystal, fine china, fine sheets, bedding, or he wanted first-class stuff all the way. Well, and he kind of grew up that way, right? He did. Yeah, he grew up in a wealthier family than Stephanie did. But he seemed to kind of take it all for granted. Seemed almost like his goal in life was to work as little as he could and get as much as he could out of the world. That's very a, different. It's a very apt description of it. Yeah, him. very different from Stephanie. Now, status was very important to Craig, but not to Stephanie. Whenever they went to a wedding, if he and Stephanie weren't seated right up front, he would pout and he'd feel slighted. And appearances were a top priority for him. 
And he really wasn't into hard work, like I said. Right. And in fact, what many people would see as the main huge difference between Stephanie and Craig was their work ethic. Now, Stephanie had always been a hard worker, but Craig really lacked ambition, and he was happy to move from one job to another. I would also say maybe one low-paying job to another. He, he never got a job that he thought was worthy of him. No, and I don't think he wanted a job at all. Oh, he didn't. At one time, he had planned to open a summer camp for kids. That fell through. After that, he worked at a woman's spa. Then he worked as a real estate appraiser. In 1990, the year that he and Stephanie were married, he and a friend started a business. It was called CNC Vending, and it evolved into a two-man operation that sold latex gloves to healthcare practitioners. This partnership broke up early, and Craig then branched out on his own, starting a new company that he called CNC Supplies. Did you catch the subtle difference? They switched supplies for vending. Yes, and CNC was because they were both named Craig. Right. So, but he's still in the latex glove business, at least allegedly. And the way he explained it to Stephanie's parents, Anne and Lou, he bought containers of latex gloves from Malaysia, and he resold them to Philadelphia area retailers. And according to him, he made a 33% profit on the sale of every container of gloves, which worked out to about $11,000 per sale. Now, this was nearly 100% profit, since his only expense was for rental of warehouse space. Now, he made the business sound so promising that Ann and Lou, and even Stephanie's brother Ira, invested when Craig came to them asking if they would be willing to buy back a loan he needed to make a big sale. He said he needed $88,000 to buy four containers of gloves. Now, the terms of the loan were steep, he explained. 19% interest for six months. Wow. So that meant he had to pay back the original amount plus $8,500 in interest for a total of $96,500. But he was sure he could sell the gloves for $132,000, which would net him $35,500, making this high interest rate very worthwhile. But that doesn't account for giving money back to them. Minor detail. Well, I just think he must have been a charmer for them to do this. I can't imagine anyone in my family doing that for me. I just could never charm them into that. No, and we also should mention that not only did he hit up Stephanie's parents and brother, but he hit up their friends. Sure. So they had a circle of friends that they hung around with and did a lot of things with, and he put the bite on those people, too. They didn't see it that way. They thought they were getting in on something. Well... Yeah, they thought they were in early. So the irony to me here is he was probably a pretty good salesman if he put his gifts towards something productive and not evil. True, but he didn't want to work. I mean, exactly. But it just seems getting money from people like this kind of was work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Craig would put up his and Stephanie's house as security, but their $230,000 house already had two mortgages on it, which totaled 204000 so he couldn't borrow any more against it at that point. Yeah, now the interesting thing here to me is, well, they've been married months to a year. Not very long. And, and they've got this house that they've already got two mortgages on. Yes. That's a red flag to me. It certainly is, and I, I'm surprised that Stephanie was okay with this. Well, I'm not sure how much she knew about that, because I, I would think, given her work ethic, that she'd be quite worried. I would think so, but if he's hitting her parents up for money, she must know about the mortgages. I guess. I think it's she just... put up with a lot of a lot for him. I think she must have. Yeah. So Anne and Lou, Stephanie's parents, talked it over, and they agreed to offer their own home in Elkins Park as collateral. This was not the first time they'd put themselves out to help Stephanie and Craig. They had agreed to let their daughter and son-in-law live with them four years before, only a little more than three years after they'd been married. One night when they were having dinner together, Craig had casually announced that he and Stephanie were moving in with them. We want to save money, he said with a big smile on his face. So how could they say no to that? I think what they did is they ended up charging him like $50 a month rent. And then when they moved out, they gave them that money back. That they did. So these were devoted parents. They were really sweet parents that would do anything to help their daughter. Now, what they didn't discover until later was that Stephanie and Craig had moved in because they were already deeply in debt. 
the owner of the apartment building where they were renting was suing them for about $6,000 in unpaid fees. Their joint bank account at the time had a $98 balance, so Stephanie's parents repaid that debt for them. They seemed to have confidence that Craig would pay off the loan for the gloves and that they would get their house deed back, along with a large interest payment. So this is something that's been evolving for a while, because they had been living with her parents, and then they were in their house, and he's hitting them up for money. Yes, yeah. So Stephanie, for her part, was 29 years old and seemed to have the life she wanted. She had a husband she loved. She had a career as an attorney in a top law firm in Philadelphia. And the house they lived in was a two-story colonial on Philadelphia's main line. Then they had an infant daughter, Haley, who was just about a year old and learning to walk. One evening in April 1997, she stopped to tell a neighbor about her latest project, which was a first birthday party for her daughter Haley, just five days away. She was thinking of planting more flowers in the yard for the party, and she wanted everything to be perfect. But just four and a half hours after Stephanie said goodnight to her neighbor on April 29th, Craig called 911. Stephanie and Craig had gone out to dinner with her parents to celebrate the end of Passover. After they returned home, Craig and Stephanie shared a couple of beers, and Craig settled in to watch the flyers in the Stanley Cup. Stephanie went in to take a bath, and before he knew it, he said an hour had passed and Stephanie was still in the bathroom. Craig entered the bathroom to check on her and found her unconscious in the tub. Stephanie was unresponsive in the tub, he told the 911 operator. And within minutes, police arrived and found Craig kneeling in a bathtub full of water, cradling his wife's head in his hands. Stephanie, naked except for jewelry, lay in the tub motionless. Craig explained that he had heard a thud in the bathroom where his wife was taking a bath, but he thought it was just a shampoo bottle tipping over so he hadn't gone in right away. So the first police officer to arrive at the scene was James Driscoll. He went into the house through the front screen door and ran up the stairs. At the top, on his right, was a tiny bathroom with a bathtub, a vanity, and a toilet. Craig, wearing cut-off jeans, a blue polo shirt, and white sweat socks, was kneeling in the tub, water up to the middle of his thighs. Stephanie was in his arms, her head flopped limply to one side, and she was blue. So, you know, I'm listening to you. That's what you should do. Thank you. You're right. (laughs) Anyway, I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking, this sounds to me like it's staged. Okay, give me a couple of reasons. This scene. It's a little similar to a case we did recently about a woman in her bathtub. It sure is. Here he is kneeling in in the tub with his wife cradled in his arms, and I'm sure he's weeping and sobbing and everything. Why isn't she out on the floor with him performing CPR or trying to resuscitate her? Had he already decided she was dead? Apparently. It just sounds like he's looking for the sympathetic vote. The other thing that would make me a little suspicious, I guess, would be that she had her jewelry on. I don't know. I just assumed that you took off necklaces and bracelets and stuff when you took a bath. Well, I think so, and especially a watch, because she had a fairly cheap watch. She wasn't into fancy things, and I'm sure that it wasn't waterproof. Now, when I take a bath, I'd leave my little earrings in, maybe a necklace if it's something I wore a lot. But other than that, or a wedding ring, I'd leave on. Yeah. But a watch and bracelets is odd. It just sounded a little weird to me. Yeah. So, and and the story he says is that she went to take a bath, and I guess she fell and hit her head. I can't revive her. Now, the 911 call had gone to an ambulance service in nearby Narberth, but since the Lower Marion Police Department was closer than the ambulance service. Officer Driscoll had beaten the paramedics to the scene. She's so heavy, Craig told them, moaning and crying. So together, the two of them got Stephanie out of the tub and laid her on the floor on her back. Driscoll clamped an oxygen mask over her face and flipped the switch, starting the flow of oxygen. Water poured out of her nose and mouth. And Driscoll began CPR as Craig was begging him to save her. Now, he stopped doing the CPR when he heard a baby crying. He told Craig to go and see to the baby, and he continued the CPR. Now, he was still doing CPR three minutes later when the paramedics arrived. The paramedics carried Stephanie out into the hall where there was more room. 
Then they lifted her onto a gurney, hurried down the stairs when they were unable to revive her. As the paramedics are going out the door, Craig reappeared with their baby Haley in his arms. What are they doing? He asked shrilly. Where are they taking her? So the officer said, well, they're taking her to the hospital. They haven't been able to revive her, and you should go too. Craig said, well, I can't. What about the baby? Now, he'd hardly spoken these words when a man and a woman came up the stairs and said they'd take Haley. And this was a neighbor, Jane Rothstein and her husband, and she told him to go ahead to the hospital. But before Craig could leave, Officer Driscoll took out a pen and paper and asked him a few questions. So he was already thinking things were a little wonky. He asked Craig what had happened that night. And Craig said that Stephanie had been having trouble sleeping and she went to take a bath. Driscoll asked Craig where he had been, and he said he was in the master bedroom watching a hockey game. When she didn't come out, he went in to check on her and he found her in the tub. Her head was underwater. He said he didn't know how that happened. He'd heard a thump, but he thought it was just a shampoo bottle falling. It always does that, he said. I should have gone to help her when I heard that thump. So Driscoll asked, was there anyone else in the house? And Craig said, no, just me and Steph and the baby. I had closed up for the night like I usually do. I locked the doors and then I went upstairs. Driscoll told him he needed to change his clothes and get to the hospital. And that's when Craig covered his face with his hands and really kind of seemed to have some kind of a meltdown. He said he was trying to hold and comfort her in the tub and he was so sorry. And that's what you had brought up. Why would you hold and comfort someone in distress, obviously, with some kind of physical problem in a tub full of water? Well, that's my point. And then he already did seem to think she was dead because he added, what are me and the baby going to do without her? I mean, we know that he already knew she was dead. We know that now. We know that now. Yes, but Driscoll didn't know initially. No, he didn't. Although she was blue. While Craig was changing into some dry clothes, Driscoll walked back into the bathroom where Stephanie had been found. And he was surprised to see the water was still slowly draining from the tub. So kind of as a reflex, responding to training that told him everything was evidence, he replaced the rubber plug, which must have come dislodged when they took her out of the tub. And as he did, he remembered that there had been no water on the floor when he'd entered, until he and Craig had removed her, and then they had ended up splashing the area. The floor had been completely dry. So he scribbled a note on his pad, and then he looked around some more. In a neat pile on the floor... There were a pair of dark sweatpants, a t-shirt with the word G-A-P on the front, Gap, and a pair of off-white printed panties with a feminine napkin resting on top. And Driscoll wrote all this down. There had been something really unusual about how Stephanie appeared. When he and Craig had pulled her from the tub, he'd noticed that she'd been wearing several pieces of jewelry. So he made a note of this. It was kind of an inexpensive-looking gold-colored watch her wedding ring, and a couple of bracelets, one on each wrist. So Stephanie is pronounced dead at the hospital at 1.25 in the morning, a victim of a head injury or an accidental drowning. That was the thought at the time, anyway. When Craig was told that Stephanie was dead, he started rocking and rubbing his head, repeating, I knew it, I knew it. He mumbled about his father, who died of cancer three years previously. I can't go through this again, he whispered. I just can't. Craig called several friends who showed up at the hospital. How can I ever face her parents again, he said. They trusted me to take care of her, and I didn't. Stephanie's parents arrived within minutes, and when her mother Anne heard that her daughter was dead, she threw herself into her husband's arms and began shrieking. Craig grimaced and buried his face in his hands which some people could see as a sign of guilt. What do you think? Well, I don't think that single action would make me suspicious. But if I look at things in the kind of big picture, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Well, while 29-year-old women were regularly killed in car accidents and got beaten up by jealous boyfriends or overdosed on drugs, there just weren't many who were found unconscious in their own bathtubs especially not in a neighborhood like Marion. Lower Marion's residents were mainly professionals, doctors, lawyers, dentists, bankers, entrepreneurs, and corporate executives. In addition to being recognized as a haven for Jewish professionals, something else that made Marion different was the mainline community. 
In the early 1800s, when Montgomery County was still being settled, the legislature, recognizing that the area was ripe for development, authorized a series of improvement projects that included feeder roads, canals, and short-line railroads. This project formerly was designed as a main line of public works, and this led to the term main line for settlements in the legislature-mandated improvement area. Then it began being applied to other communities as well. Marion, which is not along the Pennsylvania Railroad, is still considered a mainline community, and this term has been used by Philadelphians to signify some wealth and social status. By 1997, mainline was still an active term in Pennsylvanians' vocabularies. Many, especially those in the media, regarded mainliners with envy and awe, not dissimilar to the ways that people in Los Angeles look at those who live in Brentwood or how New Yorkers look at those who live in Greenwich, Connecticut. A murder was reported differently if it occurred in a mainline community than it would have been if it had happened, say, in North Philadelphia, which is a poor, crime-ridden section of the city. The doctor in the emergency room who pronounced Stephanie dead told investigators that he had seen nothing to indicate that she had not died accidentally. A detective went to the room where Stephanie's body was being kept, Pulling back the sheet, he saw a young woman who looked like she was just sleeping. He examined her body. Now, by then, all of her jewelry had been removed, so he did not know that she had been wearing any when she was brought to the hospital. The detective saw no signs of violence, no bullet holes, no knife wounds, no needle punctures, no bruising, no nothing. He went to speak to her family. Stephanie's father, Lou Newman, had not seen his daughter since he and Anne had left the Rabinowitzes at about 8 o'clock the night before. Craig Rabinowitz was visibly upset, but dry-eyed and coherent when the detective found him sitting in the waiting room. In a steady voice, Craig gave the detective a more detailed version of the incident than he had given Officer Driscoll. But it was pretty much the same. There was nothing he had seen that morning that led him to suspect that Stephanie Rabinowitz's death was not an accident. Well, Stephanie's parents were quite upset when they heard that there would be an autopsy. Many Jews were opposed to postmortems, claiming that they violated the body and God's law. In some places, such as Israel, autopsies were not infrequently a political issue. On one side were the religious traditionalists, and on the other were the scientists, who claimed that autopsies helped determine potentially inheritable fatal diseases and conditions, and of course law enforcement authorities, who said that they were often necessary to help track down and prosecute killers. Right. I mean, the parents, Stephanie's parents, were very observant Jews. And you're supposed to have a burial, ideally, within 24 hours of death. Yes, because they also didn't believe in embalming, right? Right. And then they sit Shiva for a week. And Shiva is the mourning process, where you're in the house, the mirrors are covered, so you You can't look in mirrors, you don't watch TV, you don't talk on the phone, you don't do anything except mourn the dead. Right. And the whole family stays in one place together? They do. The problem, though, with this, or at least from Craig's standpoint, in terms of wanting a quick burial, is that this was an unusual death. 29-year-old women don't normally die in a bathtub. Of course, yeah. So the physicians who would perform an autopsy if one was done, really wanted to do one, because they didn't have otherwise an idea what had happened to Stephanie. Oh, I think it went beyond wanting to. They insisted in a kind way, in a gentle way. They did insist. It had to be done. Basically, they they said we were going to have to do it. So Dr. Ian Hood was a deputy medical examiner in Philadelphia County, and he was one of the best pathologists in the area. Because Montgomery County did not have enough violent deaths to warrant two full-time pathologists, the county government had worked out an agreement with Philadelphia County whereby its physicians could be used on a contract basis. Now, Stephanie's family obviously was against the autopsy, but the medical examiner's office insisted on it. By the time Ian Hood got his first look at Stephanie Rabinowitz, it had been more than 10 hours since she had been pronounced dead. The passage of time was a good thing, for the pathologist, since some of the marks of violent death do not become evident right away, but does become evident after the blood drains from the surface of the skin. And this is particularly true in strangulation deaths. 
So it can be several hours after death before the petechiae, which are those tiny red marks about the size of pinholes, which are the result of, su of subcutaneous hemorrhaging and a sign of strangulation. This is when they begin to appear. So Hood closely examined the skin around Stephanie's eyes, and he saw the small red spots at the corners of her eyes and on her forehead. And once he did an internal exam, he found deep bruising in the soft tissues on both sides of the neck, just below the jaw. There was also bruising on her arms and legs, elbows and, and knees. So this told him that there was way more to the story than what he had been told or what Craig had said. So Hood determined that Stephanie had been strangled. That's the thing. And he had his, not his supervisor, but one of the other pathologists review the case and, and basically go over the autopsy again, and he concurred with him too. Then in a crawl space above Craig's closet, police found evidence that this self-employed latex salesman had been leading a double life. Yeah, so they're, once they've decided that she'd been strangled, number one, number two is that Craig, by his own admission, basically incriminated himself. He said the house was locked up, there's no signs of a break-in or anything, so there's three people in the house. One's dead, one's a baby, who would be likely have done the strangulation. So they had search warrants, and they're going through his house. Mm -hmm. And actually, this when they found this stuff in the crawl space, this was their second search of the house. Yeah, stuffed in a shopping bag, they found receipts that chronicled Craig's relationship with a 25-year-old stripper known as Summer, but her actual name was Shannon Reiner. They found out that Craig had visited Reinert at Delilah's Den, which was like an upscale Philadelphia strip club. Yeah, that seems to be an oxymoron. Upscale strip club. Oh, I don't know. I think there are different levels. I think if you visited one in a really good neighborhood, and then you visited one down on uh, Skid Row, you'd be able to tell the difference. Well, maybe one's dressed up a little better, but it's still the same thing. Sure, yes. But it costs more money, I bet. Oh, certainly. And he visited 39 times since January. So that was only like four months, less than four months. Right. And he'd spent nearly $29,000 on lap dances and gifts for this young woman. His gifts to Shannon included diamond earrings and $8,500 in furniture. He was arrested hours after Stephanie's funeral on charges that he murdered her for $1.5 million in life insurance and all the evidence pointed directly to him. Craig maintained that he was innocent. His lawyer, Jeffrey Miller, said that a well-dressed stranger who knocked on the neighbor's door and asked for directions to an address that didn't exist on the night of the murder may have been linked to Stephanie's death. Yeah, but they pretty quickly, I mean, there was some person in the neighborhood, but as somebody looking for his friend's house or something like that. Yeah, this had nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing. And I said $1.5 million, but I think there was more through the lawyer's office. It turned out to be like $2 million, I believe. Close to. Yeah. Because he had, there were actually four different policies. There was a couple through her law firm, and then a couple more that he had taken out. And one was a million-dollar policy that he took out fairly recently. Yeah, we'll get into that. Okay. Well, initially, Craig's friends and Stephanie's parents stood by him. But after three weeks of these really damning disclosures, even his friends no longer really knew who Craig was. So why don't we take a quick break here before we start with our big denouement. Okay. So let's do our sponsors some credit here. Okay, well, you know I've been singing the praises of Madison Reed for some time now. Not only does Madison Reed make a wonderful product, but this is a company founded by a woman and marketed to strong women everywhere who want to look beautiful without going into debt or spending hours in a salon. Going to the salon can be a luxury, but it's very expensive and very time consuming. I don't know about you, but I have better things to do with my time. I actually had been getting my hair done at a salon for years, I must admit, and I never thought I would color my hair at home again. Those drugstore box colors are so hit or miss, mostly miss. Madison Reed, though, is really reinventing the way we color our hair by giving us the quality of salon color, along with the convenience and affordability of at-home color. Madison Reed also has an ammonia-free formula with ingredients you can really feel good about. Join me in getting multidimensional European hair color delivered to your home on your schedule 
for under $25. You'll look like you just walked out of a salon, but in reality, you're going to get more me time to do what you love doing. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed is also honoring True Crime Brewery listeners with 10% off and free shipping on your first color kit if you use the promo code BREWERY. That's madison-reed.com and the promo code is BREWERY. This episode is also sponsored by ADT. ADT can design and install a smart home just for you, backed by 24-7 protection. And there are a vast number of things you can do with your own secure smart home. ADT has doorman service, which is ADT automation that can unlock doors for package deliveries, friends, or kids who forget their keys. Well, another really cool service of ADT smart homes is turndown service. This is ADT automation that arms your security system, locks your doors, and even turns down your lights and thermostat. They think of everything. ADT even offers worry-free getaway service, which lets you arm your system, lock up, and set lighting schedules while you're on vacation. And this is all controlled from the ADT app or the sound of your voice and backed by ADT's 24-7 protection. Best of all, with ADT, you don't have to worry about installing and configuring your system. ADT does that for you. Well, if this sounds good to you, just visit ADT.com forward slash smart to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. So investigators were confident that Stephanie had been strangled. I mean, they had the autopsy results. There were some bruises on her knee and sides of her arms also. Now, from the types of bruises and where they were, she, she was probably strangled by hand in the tub. So whoever did it probably got her into the tub first, then grabbed her around the throat just under her jaw and cut off her airway. So if you strangled that way, you don't have to break that little hyoid bone. Which, which is, is something we were looking for in the autopsy. Right, and it's always kind of pathic mnemonic for uh, strangulation. But if you grip high enough, you can achieve strangulation without fracturing the hyoid. Hmm. Police also considered the, the fact that Stephanie may have been drugged. Based on her stomach contents, Hood believes she died about 9.30 that evening, which actually is three hours before Craig called 911. So I wonder how cold the water was, or if he actually added more hot water to the tub to make her seem less cold, because three hours is a long time. It is. I never saw any actual body temperature readings, but she felt cold, mm -hmm. and she was blue. So you're thinking, if you're a medical person, when the first police officer arrived, that she'd been dead for a while, because she was blue and cold. But this is really all kind of hard to believe, because as far as anyone knew, Stephanie and her husband were upright, respectable citizens. Well, they, and they lived they on were. the main line. Yeah, so mainliners don't kill each other. Not usually. These were really ingredients, too, for a media frenzy when it came out that Stephanie had been murdered. Investigators knew it would be impossible to keep the circumstances of Stephanie's death quiet for very long, so this is when time became an issue for them. They had to move fast, not only before the media got involved, but also before Craig could cover his tracks. They were confident that Craig didn't know that he was the prime suspect at this point, and he was unaware that they even knew that Stephanie had been murdered. So once the media knew that she had been murdered, then the advantage of surprise was going to be lost. As soon as Craig knew that they suspected him, he was going to lawyer up. Yeah, what they needed to do was lock him into his version of what happened before he found out about the autopsy results. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good idea. I do too. So they came up with what seemed to be a simple plan. They wouldn't tell Craig what they knew until after he told them what he knew or what he wanted them to believe. So they brought him down to the police station, took his statement, and then told him that they knew Stephanie had been murdered. And he acted shocked. He was just amazed. He probably was kind of shocked that they knew. I'm sure he was. When they refused to release her body for burial, and they were going to do an autopsy, he probably got a little worried. Well, more than a little worried, sure. Right? I, think, I bet that panicked him a bit. Because I think he was counting on the Jewish traditions to save his ass. Oh, I think there's no doubt. Yeah. No doubt at all in my mind that he was figuring... I got these observant Jew in-laws, and they're going to insist on burying her very quickly. And that's going to obscure my participation in this crime. Right. Because this was not a spur-of-the-moment thing. No. I think he was planning this for months. 
There's no question he was. Okay. So a man who could cold-bloodedly strangle his wife while their infant daughter was sleeping just six or eight feet away wasn't someone who was likely to fall apart very easily during questioning. Strangulation, as you know, is a very cold-blooded act, and it takes time to complete. It's not like pulling a trigger or slashing a knife. This takes several minutes. Several minutes. With that person probably thrashing around and, and trying to save themselves. Exactly. Stephanie and Craig had been viewed as a close couple by friends and family members, but Craig was leading this secret life from way back. He had brought prostitutes to their home back in 1993, and he was trapped in a sting operation, but he agreed to cooperate with police in exchange for immunity. And as far as we know, all this happened without Stephanie's knowledge, which is hard to imagine, but he seemed like he was good at fooling her. Right. And the ironic thing about this immunity, where he testified for the police, is that he thought that there would not be any record of that. But there was. Right. And he had immunity, but there was still stuff in court proceedings that showed he had testified. Exactly, yeah. So we not only have Summer, his latest love of his life, we have evidence that several years previously he had been frequenting prostitutes. Yeah, he was just kind of a horrible guy for years. After Haley's birth the previous May, Stephanie reduced her hours at the law firm, so her pay had been cut down to about $33,000 a year. So that may have caused some financial concerns for the couple. But investigators weren't able to find any recent record of income for Craig. So here's the real big red flag waving in the air. This turns this, out to be such the, a big thing. This is just amazing. So it turns out that Rabinowitz had created this really huge financial mess. He was borrowing from friends and using the couple's heavily mortgaged house as collateral on bank loans, which totaled more than 100000 in the past year, and was charging an additional 60000 on a variety of credit cards that were billed to a post office box. And his spending increased after he met Shannon Reinert. On April 28th, according to court documents, Craig spent $600 at Delilah's and received a voicemail message from Reiner just an hour and a half before he called 911 about Stephanie. When they did look at this, this was basically a Ponzi scheme. He was hitting up friends and, and relatives and so on for money, and he was using proceeds from the money to pay off the earlier investors. Typical Ponzi scheme. So it's kind of like a little Madoff yeah, in a smaller scale. A minor league Bernie Madoff. <laughs> yeah. Now, he had large life insurance policies in place. There was a $1.6 million policy on him and $1.5 million on Stephanie. Both of these had been taken out after Haley was born. There was also two more policies through the law firm where Stephanie worked. A $500,000 policy on her and one on him for $150,000. So he's counting on getting $2 million. Yes, he was looking for that. But a lot of that is already spoken for for his debts, amazingly enough. So investigators said that Craig had pawned Stephanie's engagement ring and other jewelry for $2,200 just two days after her death. This development apparently caused him the support of Stephanie's family when they heard about it. Well, no shit. Mm. According to Honey Foreman, who's a cousin of Stephanie's, the news about the jewelry was the last straw for the Newman family. When it was announced in May that Stephanie had been murdered, the media accepted two things. The first was that Craig Rabinowitz was a small businessman selling latex products, and the other was that Craig and Stephanie had lived a good life. One described by Craig's attorney, Jeffrey Miller, as tranquil, almost utopian. Big words there, huh? Well, it seems a bit ridiculous to say utopian to me. <laughs> well... His lawyers were prone to hyperbole. But both of these statements would prove to be false. The early media challenge was to Craig's business claims. According to a story in the regional edition of The Inquirer, Craig had listed with the Pennsylvania State and Corporation Bureau as the sole officer, CEO, and treasurer of C&C Supplies, Inc., founded in 1992 as a successor to Craig Vending, Inc., the Inquirer pointed out that the local telephone directory had no listing for the company, and that it also wasn't recognized among the over 2,000 members of the Latex Advisors Association, 
which is the industry's trade organization. So they should have known about it. Yeah. Don't you have to register or something with them? That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the Daily News said that little is known about his work and that there were no records of bankruptcies, liens, or judgments against him. So they were a bit kinder to him in the beginning. In the beginning. But this was a non-existent business that he had. Yes. There never was a bunch of containers of latex gloves that right, he was going to yeah. sell. Sure. Well, the major shock was that Craig frequented the champagne room at Delilah's Den, and he spent a lot of money there. To save customers from carrying wads of cash and to make more money for them, the club issued its own Delilah dollars. And the way that works is that a customer uses his credit card to purchase these Delilah's dollars, which they use instead of cash to pay the dancers. And there was also a 15% fee. So when they would buy like 100 Delilah dollars, it would cost them $115. And then when the dancer would cash it in at night, the establishment would take 15% from them. So they're raking it from both sides. So they're pretty clever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they know how to make money. Well, and also to keep wives from finding out, Delilah's charges would appear on credit card statements as D&D's restaurant. So they were very helpful in that way as well. Well, I can see that. But if you're a big spender at Delilah's and the wife is looking at the credit card bill, you'd be suspicious when you're looking at hundreds of dollars a week being spent at D&D's restaurant, wouldn't you? Of course, but I think it would be less offensive and maybe not stand out as much, especially for normal customers who oh, yeah. aren't paying as it, like yeah. he was. No question. I mean, he was above and beyond anything. He was. Well, I guess not, though. I guess he wasn't the biggest spender that Summer had. So I guess he wasn't that far apart. But I think the people that paid more money than him were much wealthier than him and had well, the money to spend, of course. He didn't have anything. No, but he was able to come up with a lot when he wanted to. That he was. So Craig's secret life became front page news in what was to become locally known as the mainline murder. Craig had been spending money faster than his wife could earn it on a stripper. Later, after analyzing his financial data, detectives determined that in the nine months that he had been visiting Delilah's, Rabinowitz had spent at least $56,000 at the club. That included some $29,000 he spent in a single 13-week period between January and April, which was three weeks before Stephanie was killed. During that three-month time span, he made at least 39 trips to the club, which was an average of three visits a week at about $743 per visit or $2,330 a week. He was just getting more and more into it. Yes, definitely. After investigators had learned about Craig's spending habits at Delilah's, everyone involved in the case realized that he had been spending lots of money that no one knew where it was coming from. The source of this money was a critical missing piece to the puzzle of Stephanie's murder. Investigators and prosecutors were determined to find it. So figuring that there had to be some sort of financial records that they had not been able to find, detectives were implementing a plan for a second search of the Rabinowitz house. Since they now knew that Craig had no office outside the home, the most logical place for him to keep any information on his finances was somewhere in the house. And they decided they were going to find it, even if they had to tear the walls apart. Two detectives met with the judge, asking for another search warrant that would allow them back into the house. In the back of the highest shelf of a bedroom closet, there were several softcore porn magazines, not the kind of thing that he would want his mother, wife, or daughter to see, but not anything that would get him arrested or put in jail. They also found some Delilah's dollars, half a dozen slips of paper printed with the name of Carver W. Reed & Company, an upscale center city pawn shop, and a handful of what appeared to be receipts. Now one was for a $300 golf club, others were for flowers, diamond earrings, bracelets, and a pearl necklace. These receipts corroborated the stripper's story about gifts that she had received from Craig. And there were also receipts for living room, dining room, and children's furniture. The bottom of the bag, looking at first glance like nothing, was a piece of paper covered with figures and lettering. It was written by hand, and it was complete with scribbles and some crossouts. It was a ledger of, of sorts. It had names and numbers for incoming and outgoing amounts of money. Yeah, but what looked like idle doodling on a piece of scrap paper, turned out to be the motive for Stephanie's murder. So this is something that the prosecution poured over, and they actually hired a forensic accountant to do this. 
this was a cool story, actually. Mm -hmm. this, this guy named Zayas worked for them, worked for the police department, and, and became quite well known. So what he found was basically entries of what he owed versus what he had for income or what he's going to get in income. Now, when you say income. So, well, okay. So the left side, he had some initials and what turned out to be money owed to people. And these were basically friends and relatives who had loaned money to him with the promise of being repaid and with interest. So he had the amount owed with the interest for them. Then the other side was, was his income. So he's listed how much the life insurance policies would bring in. He was going to sell the house. That's an asset. Going to sell cars, another asset. So he ended up saying that he had over $2 million coming in and about $700,000 that he owed. So he had about a million and a half dollars that he was going to net. So then he had another thing written on the right side of the column. He had a $1 million underlined. And the forensic accountant figured out that once he paid everything off, he was going to keep the 400000 and put a million dollars into some kind of account. And if he got 8% interest, that account would generate $6,600 a month in income. And if he got a return of 8.5%, it would be 6850 per month. So that's his tabulation on how he was going to end up. But the point is, none of this money came from working. And the money that he borrowed, he borrowed deceptively. He did. But he's going to pay it back eventually. That's, that's why Stephanie had to go. Because he wasn't going to be able to pay it back, not even come close to paying it back, without cashing in the insurance policies. Well, that was the entire plot. Right. Well, on May 8th, the toxicology report came back, and tests on Stephanie's blood and gastric fluid certified that shortly before her death, she'd taken some Ambien. So this is an effective sleeping medication that begins acting within 20 minutes after it's ingested. And the analysis showed that when Stephanie died, she had about three times what would be considered a normal dose in her system. Ambien was what Craig had said he had obtained a prescription for because he and his wife had been suffering from mild insomnia. The bottle the drug had come in, though, was missing. It hadn't been found in either of the two searches of the home. When he saw the toxicology results, Dr. Hood became more convinced than ever that his original theory about how Stephanie had died was correct. In his opinion, Craig had drugged Stephanie with Ambien, and once she was unconscious, carried her upstairs into the bathtub, intending to drown her. But the water probably revived her and she woke up, at least enough to struggle, and this is when she would have bruised her outer arms by banging them against the sides of the tub. When it became apparent that he wasn't going to be able to drown her, that's when Craig strangled her, hoping that an autopsy would not be done and the death would be ruled accidental and he'd get away with it. Absolutely. He had it planned out well. Mm -hmm. Then less than 24 hours after they found the shopping bag and note in Craig's closet, investigators learned that Rabinowitz spent $8,500 for furniture for Shannon's house, that he'd bought two memberships at an upscale sporting club, one for himself and one for her, at $375 apiece, plus an additional $136 a month in fees, laundry service, shoe shines, and a locker in the VIP section. And that would have been in the same row as the mayor and Dr. J, who was the 76er star. Now, he had repeatedly pawned Stephanie's jewelry. He had charged hundreds of dollars worth of items from major stores like Bloomingdale's and Saks between the time that he met Summer, a.k.a. Shannon, and by the end of April and that he also had on Valentine's Day 1997, only 10 weeks before Stephanie's murder, spent over $1,900 for a pearl necklace from Tiffany's. And this did not go to Stephanie. So investigators were pretty thrilled with the information they got from this shopping bag. Yeah, between what he'd borrowed from family and friends, in addition to the mortgages and credit cards, Craig was so deeply in debt that he couldn't even see the top of the hole. What hole? The hole that he dug himself into. Oh, okay. I've never heard that phrase before. I just threw that in. Okay. So his, his notes in the shopping bag showed that he needed almost three quarters of a million dollars to pay off all his loans, money owed to his family, and credit cards. So this was going to leave him about a million and a half after he collected 
the $2 million in Stephanie's life insurance. So Craig had no business at all. It was all lies. So this forensic accountant found no records of latex gloves being purchased or sold. Now, when he started the business with a friend in 1990, there were some transactions taking place. But when Craig's friend left in 92, the actual business just stopped. No clients, no meetings, no office, just all fake. He borrowed thousands from friends and from Stephanie's family. He had three mortgages on their home. He used the money to pay the mortgage. He bought tickets for the flyers, season tickets, and he paid for trips taking friends to Atlantic City. So he was maintaining a lifestyle that was just way beyond his means. For a while, Stephanie's family stood by Craig, and they even offered $75,000 to get him out of jail. But his bail was set at $5 million, and he wasn't going to get out. Once the news about Summer came out, the local papers were covered with pictures of her and stories about Craig Rabinowitz. This, along with Craig's financial lies and pawning Stephanie's jewelry, finally turned Stephanie's family against him. You know, Craig actually left Shiva to pawn Stephanie's jewelry. And a lot of that jewelry was actually family heirlooms. So you can imagine they were quite upset when they found that out. I can only imagine. I'll bet they were really pissed. Yeah. And probably a little bit shocked. Because they thought this guy was part of their family. He was. And again, he was this guy so gregarious and into people. People liked him. They all liked him. And and at least initially, nobody could believe that he'd be capable of doing such a thing. Such a scumbag, I know. Yeah. Well, they didn't have actually a lot of physical evidence that Craig had murdered Stephanie, but they had this enormous amount of circumstantial evidence of his guilt. They got a warrant for his credit card statements, which also revealed huge amounts of money that he'd spent at Delilah's. There was also a packed suitcase in cash hidden in the trunk of his car. The autopsy on Stephanie proved that she had been strangled, and the only people in the home, of course, were Craig, Stephanie, and their infant daughter. So it was really closing in on him, to put it mildly. Yeah, he was cooked. Yes, he was. So on October 30th, 1997, the trial was scheduled to begin. But before it began, to everyone's shock, Craig pleaded guilty. In his statement, he said that Stephanie had come to him in a dream, and this motivated him to confess. He stood sobbing before a judge and pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. Yes, I guess the law is, if you decide to do that, you have to actually sit and explain why. And he had to do that. He did. But he seemed to feel sorry for himself quite a bit. Well, and and the other thing, I think one of the, the reasons for pleading guilty, besides the fact that he was going to be found guilty anyway, Yeah. if he pled guilty, all this horrible information about him wasn't going to come out, or at least not directly. I mean, it all did anyway. Yeah, but there weren't days of it going over it and over right. it. Yeah. So he, I think he figured the easy way out was to plead guilty. And then he doesn't have to air all his dirty laundry. But then he people. tries to say that it's some kind of thing he did because he was visited by her ghost. Yeah, such bullshit. It really is. So he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And I believe that Craig dosed Stephanie with Ambien that he'd put in her beer, and then he took her to the tub, and the water probably woke her up, and then she struggled, and he strangled her. She probably struggled and suffered for at least four minutes, right? I I think that's a very believable, likely scenario. Which means it was well planned. Right. Well, it was planned before that, or the, the germination of the plan. Well, yeah, I think he'd actually gone and gotten the prescription with this in mind. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. So a year after Stephanie's murder, Craig was interviewed by Philadelphia Weekly, and he said that Stephanie made him feel emasculated and controlled. She was too regimented, and he was more go with the flow. So he had years of resentment built up inside of him. He also said that if he was released, the first thing he would do was go see Shannon. Fat chance. Well, he kind of seemed to think it might happen. Yeah, well, he wrote to her, and she never wrote back. Right. She was done with him. Well, yeah, I mean, we really can't blame her for any of this. No. No. But the thing is, just the balls that it takes to actually blame someone he murdered. Like, oh, I had no choice. She was just, you know, too difficult. Yeah, I felt like less of a man around her. 
So talk about someone who didn't learn their lesson and should never get out of prison. I mean, come on. Yeah, I don't think he will, will he? No, he won't. But I'm just saying, some people at least show some kind of remorse. And he doesn't. He seems like he's blaming her. He, well, yeah, why not? He hasn't let's, changed a bit. Let's blame the victim. Very entitled human being. Yes. So Haley was raised by Stephanie's mother, Anne, because Stephanie's father died before the trial. Now, Haley is 23 years old now, and she goes by her mother's maiden name. Stephanie was buried also with her maiden name on her gravestone. They didn't want Craig's name on her gravestone. I wouldn't want any association with his name. No, I mean, he actually was counting on a quick burial and no autopsy because of the Jewish faith, thinking he would get away with this. So I give the ME's office a lot of credit for doing their job the correct way. Because well, the, the, the family was actually trying to stop it. Yeah, but that, the family was trying to stop it, at least initially, because they didn't have any comprehension that he could be involved. Well, why there, would they? There was no doubt that it was an accidental death. Right. And we need to bury our daughter within 24 hours. Exactly. And the medical examiners said, well, just a minute. This is a healthy woman, young. There's no particular reason why she'd die a sudden death. We need to investigate. Well, I'm, su- I'm surprised it's just not the law that in that circumstance that's done. Aren't there laws of under this circumstance I, you do an I, autopsy? I think there's different state laws. And maybe it's not in Pennsylvania, but I think that most states would have an autopsy if there was an unexplained death. I would hope so. Anyway, there was one done. It was consistent with strangulation, and that led to his downfall. Okay, well, thank you to Ken Englade for the information in his book that he wrote about this case, and that's titled Everybody's Best Friend. There's also an episode on this case on forensic files that we watched, and that's titled Summer Obsession, And there's a segment on the case on the ID show Beyond Mansion Walls. What would you say about that show? Oh, I watched that last night with you. Yeah, I know. How would you describe that show? Hokey. Okay. Sensationalized, maybe. Anyway, Behind Mansion Walls is just hilarious because the Rabinowitzes did not live in anything near a mansion. They were in kind of an affluent neighborhood, but they were living in a fairly small house. They didn't have that much money. No, they were in kind of a starter home. Exactly. for, For the main line. Right. This episode of True Crime Brewery has been sponsored by ADT. ADT can design and install a smart home just for you, backed by 24-7 protection. This can include doorman service, which is an ADT automation that unlocks the door for package deliveries, friends, or even your kids. They also have a turndown service that arms your system, locks your doors, and turns down your lights and thermostat at bedtime. This is all controlled from the ADT app, or even by the sound of your voice. Just visit ADT.com forward slash smart to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. The music for this podcast was written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you enjoy True Crime Brewery and you'd like to offer some support and gain access to members-only episodes each month, please go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and join Team Tie Grabber. Or you can also go to Patreon and become a patron. Tie Grabber members also receive gifts from us and our endless admiration and lifelong devotion. Absolutely. Okay, now it's on to feedback, which everyone's been anticipating with great eagerness. That's right. So we're going to do some voice messages first, which is going to make Jill really happy. She got three this week. I am really excited. You have to like hold me down. So the first one's from Laurel, who has a case suggestion. Hello, this is Laurel from Colorado Springs. Just want to say I love your podcast, and I've enjoyed it, catching up with it over the past year, and I have a suggestion for a case for you. This is a local one to me. It was the murder of um, and disappearance of Brooke Wilberger in 2004 in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, she was she had just finished her freshman year of college and was visiting her sister here in Corvallis. And she vanished one afternoon, uh, leaving her flip-flops behind in the parking lot where she was last seen. Uh, it was a couple of twists and turns before they finally figured out who had abducted her and what had happened to her. And um, it's a interesting case, and I think you'd enjoy um, investigating it and talking about it. Thanks again for the great podcast. Bye. Thank you, Laurel. 
Good note. See? I knew you'd be happy with that. Yeah, I love it. So Brooke Wilberger was a 19-year-old student who was abducted and later murdered. Her disappearance was covered by the national media, and her murder investigation was one of the most publicized in Oregon's history. At the time of her disappearance, she was on summer vacation, visiting and working for one of her sisters in Corvallis, Oregon. On the morning uh, of her disappearance, she is seen cleaning lampposts in the parking lot of the Oak Park Apartments, which her sister and brother-in-law managed, and she disappeared. Now, fast forward to November of 2004, and a University of New Mexico student was beaten and raped before she escaped and eventually identified Joel Patrick Courtney as her attacker. In September of 2007, Courtney pleaded guilty to the beating and rape of the student. His plea agreement called for a prison sentence of up to 18 years, plus 5 to 20 years on parole. Now, police eventually linked Courtney, who's a native of Beaverton, Oregon, to the disappearance of Wilberger. And so in August of 2005, he was charged on 19 counts of aggravated murder, kidnapping, sexual abuse, rape, and sodomy. Court documents show details that he was in Corvallis when Wilberger disappeared, and that the green van he was driving was spotted by several people, including an Oregon State University employee who identified him from the photo lineup. They also found Wilberger's DNA inside the van along with her hair. So Courtney is extradited to Oregon in April of 2008. He was facing 14 counts of charges, and charges were filed despite the absence of the body of the alleged victim at the time. Now, the prosecutor announced he was going to seek the death penalty. It was re revealed through court deposition and Courtney's confession that he had abducted Wilberger from the parking lot where she'd been cleaning lampposts on the morning in, in May. He drove her into the woods outside of town. According to Courtney, she was kept alive throughout the night before he raped her the next morning. He then bludgeoned her to death when she fought off the rape. Horrible crime. That's really horrible. And I think I saw um, some coverage of this case on a dateline several years ago. Really nice family, really a heartbreaking case. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff on TV about this case. Was there? Yes. So more than just that, huh? Well, yeah, it was a nice family, cute girl. Just a, a real shame. So we'll look into that. Sure. Yes, we will. Thanks a lot, Laurel. Okay, our next voicemail is from Crystal. And Crystal has a case suggestion as well. Hello, Jill and Dick. My name is Crystal McCullers, and I'm an avid listener to your podcast. Thank you so much for your commentary and the way you bring material to us. Jill, you had recently mentioned in one of the episodes that you would love to do cases or um, episodes on either false convictions or um, uh, false confessions, I think. And one in particular I'd love to have covered. It's it would be very different, but you know, if if you guys would be um I guess willing to do it or bold enough to do it, it's a very sensitive subject. But it's the case of Emmett Teal. Um Emmett Teal uh was an African American boy who was lynched in Mississippi in nineteen fifty five at the age of fourteen. He was visiting family from out of town and was accused um, of offending a white woman by whistling at her um, when he was at a grocery store with some family members. But anyway, the way he was hunted down and was lynched, the things they did to him were so gruesome. And his mother, um, because, you know, his body was completely unrecognizable, but his mother, because she wanted to bring so much attention to the conditions in the South, refused to have a closed casket and wanted his casket to be open so that the country could see the different things um, that were happening in the South. What makes this such a compelling case is that after what, um, 40 something, 60 something years, 63 years, uh, his accuser came out on her deathbed and um, confessed that she had completely lied and made it up. And that's what makes it so heart wrenching. Uh, this boy was 14, was, um, I mean, castrated, lynched, just, all kinds of unbearable things just to find out 63 years later that she um, 
had lied about it, had lied about the whole thing. Like I said, I know it, it may be a little bit different from what you guys usually cover. It, it would be a bold choice. I'm not sure if it would mesh well with your audience, but I'm your audience. It would mesh well with me and I would appreciate it. But, you know, even if, if you don't cover it, just to look into it. it is a compelling case. It is something um, of, I guess, a wrongful conviction, conviction, so to speak, from him. Um, and it was it was completely made up and the, the devastation that happened because of that. But again, thank you guys. I can't suggest a beer because I don't really know uh, that would go well with that episode. But keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Crystal. Interesting case. You, you want to do this? or do you, I mean, we could summarize it pretty quickly. Yes, I think she summarized it pretty well. She did. She did. It was during a summer vacation in 1955 that Emmett, 14 years old, was visiting relatives in the Mississippi Delta region. Yeah, and, he was a city boy. He was a Chicago kid. Yep, and he spoke to 21-year-old Carolyn Bryant, who was the white married proprietor of a small grocery store there. So although what happened at the store is a matter of dispute, he was accused of flirting with or whistling at her. Now, I remember one of my favorite college courses was Literature and Peace, and we had a section we did on civil rights, and this was a big part of our discussion in this case. So it stuck with me. This definitely um, brought it all back, Crystal's voicemail. And it's a heartbreaking case and a lot to talk about. I would be happy to cover this case. And I imagine you agree, Dick. Yeah, I think that'd be a great case to do. It would be nice, in a sense, to do an older case. And this is over 60 years ago yes. that it occurred. And uh, this kid kind of became an icon for the civil rights movement in his death. Yes, yeah. So... I think it'd be worth a discussion. I think so. I think it'd be great to have some civil rights discussion in with some history. Okay. So thanks a lot, Crystal. That's a great suggestion. It was. Thank you. And what is our next voicemail? We have one more voicemail from Jasmine, who also has a case suggestion. Great. Okay. Let's hear what Jasmine had to say. Hi, Jill and Dick. Uh, this is Jasmine from England, in case you hadn't been able to tell from my accent. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how... The recording is going to be because my phone won't let me record, so I'm recording on my laptop. But basically, I just wanted to talk about a case that happened where I grew up, uh, which is in a town called Colchester in a county called Essex, uh, which is little known. It's not really known for anything, as is most of England, apart from London. But basically, when I went to school, I ended up going to school with a serial killer. Uh, and this would have been from the ages of... I want to say 11 to 16, um, because that's what we call secondary school. And so, yeah, basically this this guy, he ended up killing two people. And first of all, the first we heard of it was that a disabled man had been stabbed to death in Castle Park, which was, uh, well, to give it a little bit of significance, Colchester is Britain's oldest recorded town. And so we have a lot of history and there's a castle there. Uh, and Castle Park is the massive area surrounding the castle. And so in the... Uh, a guy, a disabled guy called James Atfield was found dead. and But he was stabbed, I think, over 50 times. Uh, and they actually said that he was stabbed so many times that it must have been more than one person who did it because they didn't believe that one person could stab somebody that many times. Um, and he was found sort of in the early hours of the morning. And that's the first that we heard of it. And then for a while, we didn't hear of anything. And so we were all scared. We weren't going out at night. We weren't like uh, sort of risking anything we we weren't being out at all because everyone was terrified of the serial killer and then he kills another one a, a woman called Nadia and I don't remember her second name unfortunately but a woman called Nadia she was a um a university student who was just on a little trail walking to the university and she as she was stabbed and they only found him actually when a jogger or I think actually a man walking his dog came across a guy hiding in the bushes uh, with a knife and essentially this guy uh, tried to blame the fact that he did this on the fact that he was bullied at school, which, as far as I'm aware, and as far as a lot of my classmates are aware, he really wasn't. And it's, yeah, it's just a really interesting case because of he tried to fake mental health issues. And then, you know, it's just this, this random guy who didn't have any real reason to just kill these two people. Uh, and the trial was really, really interesting. And all of the details were released after he turned 18. So I thought that might be an interesting case uh, for you guys to do. Uh, but yeah, I love your show. And I listen religiously every single week as soon as it comes out <laughs> on Tuesday. Uh, for me, I think about 2pm. Love you guys. 
All right. Thanks, Jasmine. Yeah, you know, I, I listened to your talk and I thought at first that you were from New Jersey, not from England. <laughs> yeah, okay. But yeah, this, uh, I was looking things up and I, I got some information on the Atfield murder. And I haven't yet been able to find much on the Nadia person, but it, it looks pretty interesting. James Atfield, as you said, was a, a disabled person who had a significant amount of trauma to his brain after being hit by a car four years before he died or before he was killed. Uh, so he was definitely a disabled person uh, who could move around and all, but uh, he had a significant amount of brain damage. Okay. And he was apparently uh, sitting on a bench in the park or in the park, Castle Park, as Jasmine said. And he was attacked and stabbed more than 100 times, actually. So a vulnerable person. Yes. Horribly attacked. He was. And then not a, too, long late, too long of a time later, Nadia, whoever, was attacked and killed. Oh, and you couldn't find record of her. That's interesting. No, but I've got to dig a little deeper. Okay. But I think we'll, we'll look into that and see what we can do with it. Okay. All right. Now you've got a couple emails. I know you hate those things. I do not hate them. I just prefer the voicemails. I'm really happy I had three this week. I feel special getting three. That's awesome. So I thank those wonderful women. And now these first two are both on the same case, the Widmer case, where the wife was found drowned in the bathtub. Okay, so we have Draconius with the morning sword comment on Widmer case. What does that mean? I, I think it's a, a podcast or something that he does called The Morning Sword. Oh, okay, great. All right. He or she. Okay, so he or she wrote, First time hearing your podcast. I didn't believe I would like the style of it at first, but ended up enjoying it for being different and refreshing, and for both of you using intelligence and empathy when examining the case. I am familiar with the Widmer case. I don't think Ryan is guilty of killing her, not directly, but I do think that he lied about the time of finding her body for some reason. Maybe he had hit her for the first time. She takes a bath then and falls into narcolepsy and dies. Who knows, but I think he found her body, pulled it out of the tub, and waited to call 911, possibly believing he would be blamed for the murder, which is which his waiting incidentally caused. Once he told his story, he may have felt locked in and knew it would have made him appear more guilty if he told the truth. She may have also dislodged the drain plug or flipped the drain open as her body convulsed in death. As I am sure you know, drowning is a very violent physical death. I have seen it once while in the service, and it was one of the most horrible deaths I have seen. I would imagine it is horrible. Yeah, so I, I picked this one because we had a lot of comments on the bathtub, Widmer bathtub case. But I chose this one because I like his idea that Ryan was, for some reason, lying about the time he found her body, for whatever reason. Because I, I think that strikes a chord in me. Yeah, I never considered that. I don't know if I really buy into that at all. Well, I, I was just thinking that he, he did, as the writer says, that he made this story up and then had to stick with it. Yeah, but what, how are we saying she died then is where I'm stuck. Well, that's the other thing. Because she couldn't die. We've already decided if she was in the tub and fell asleep, she would wake up. Even if she had narcolepsy, she would wake up when she started taking in water. But we also discussed that maybe she suffered from long QT syndrome and had a, an arrhythmia that caused her demise by drowning or that she had a seizure. So if he had hit her, he would have thought that maybe he did cause it, and that's why he lied? Well, I wasn't even looking at that he might may have hit her. Oh, well, that's what the letter said. I, I know that's what the letter says, but I was just... So you're picking and choosing what you like from the letter. I am. <laughs> okay. I am. I'm, I'm picking the part where he <laughs> says that, or he, he or she says that he had to come up with a story quickly, and once he told that story, he was beholden to it. Okay. I'm not sure how I feel about the case, so it's I'm open to everybody's opinion here. Okay. So I accept that opinion. Okay. And then we have another comment on the same case from Sue Ann, who says, I have narcolepsy, and I know the symptoms can be very different or how bad they are, so I can only tell you from my own experience. I have fallen asleep while walking, talking, eating, driving, cycling, and working. 
in public places, in nightclubs, at dinner tables, or friends' places, etc. But normally I do wake up if something happens. For example, when I fall, I wake up during the fall before the impact. So for me, it's hard to imagine that I could drown without waking up from the struggle to breathe. And, okay. And, and we decided that too. And that's what some of the experts have said. Yeah. I mean, whether you have narcolepsy or you just fall asleep for whatever reason, once your face gets into the water, there's going to be kind of a reflex that stimulates you to breathe or try to breathe and wake up. And there was an expert who testified in, I think it was Ryan's first trial, maybe more than just the first trial about that. But I am interested by her statement that says that the symptoms can be different. So there are varying degrees of seriousness yeah, no, in I narcolepsy. Didn't. Yeah, we didn't talk about that, but there are. There's a whole spectrum. But from what we read about Sarah, hers wasn't that extreme compared to Sue Ann's. No, it wasn't. I mean, she didn't fall asleep eating or driving. Sarah could get through the work day. She could drive back and forth to work. Yeah. Yeah. So she didn't seem to have that severe of a case. No. So I don't feel like narcolepsy is an issue in that case. Then we have a case suggestion from Karen81986. Prosecutors contend Todd Kendhammer fatally beat his wife of 25 years and tried to conceal her death by staging a freak car accident. Kendhammer says she died when an airborne pipe pierced his windshield and struck her in the head. So I think we've gotten suggestions for this before, and I do find it fascinating. We've talked about this before, we have. haven't we? Because it sounded familiar, but it, it was a, an interesting case. What did you find really interesting about it? Well, the primary thing was how stupid the guy was. <laughs> yeah. I mean... But it's a far-fetched claim. It's so far out in left field, maybe it's believable, but he didn't go about it the right way. No. So what were some of the things that caught him? Well, so he said that they were driving along and uh, there was a truck in front of them and a piece of pipe dislodged from the truck, the bed of the truck, and came flying to their car, pierced their windshield and struck his wife in the head, killing her. And she was the passenger. She was on the passenger side. He was driving. Now, the things that did him in were that they never found evidence of a truck that had pipes in it. Being on that road. Being on that road at right. that time. The pattern of broken glass suggested that the passenger seat was not occupied when the windshield was broken. So was there glass beneath her? Yeah. Well, that's pretty basic, basic problem. They also figured that the passenger side door had been open when the glass had broken because there was no glass in the side pockets of the door, as there should have been. So he missed a lot of things. Well, and the biggest thing was the, the extent of her injuries. There was a lot of wounds on the back of her head. Oh, gee. So So he had beaten her to death with an instrument? or Probably with that pipe. And then oh. he managed to knock it through the window, or put it through the window and did that. But he got caught. He's been convicted. So is that something where this was planned out, or he killed her and then came up with this lame brain idea to good. try and cover it up? That's a good question. I'm not sure. We'd I, have to look into it I'd for have that. to look in a little bit more, but I, I think it was... A planned act. Now, was it, his trial televised? Is it something we can watch? There's a tape of his trial. I don't know if it's audio or video or both or what. Oh, okay. So, okay. But if, if we, we should look into this. I think one other big factor, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't somebody drive by and see his car on the side of the road with the window intact? Yeah, that's the report I got. I was reading about that his, his car was in a ditch or, or off the side of the road and somebody passed by and the windshield was unscathed. So a lot of problems with his story. Yeah, the story just doesn't hold up, does it? And what do we know about this guy beforehand? Do we know anything about what kind of guy he was, what his history was, or is that all stuff we need to look into? That's stuff we need. I just did the basic quick look to sure. see how interested we might be. Okay. Yeah, I think we might be interested. I think that um, a lot of people seem interested in this case. Just something about the quirky cover-up is makes it an interesting story to me, and probably other people probably feel that way. I think so. I think it'd be good to try. So let's look into that one then. I think we have three or four recommendations today that we're going to seriously consider. We do. Awesome. Well, thanks to everyone for writing in and especially for calling in. I just really appreciate that so much. I appreciate everyone listening 
And I just can't wait until next week when we'll see you again at the quiet end. We'll be there. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.